The reason why I say we can actually navigate to water using our compass is because if we have a relative idea of where we are, let's say southern hemisphere, we know the sun passes east to west, but because I'm in South Africa, the sun is going to pass due north of me, which means that it casts a shadow on the southern side of rocky outcrops and of mountains. I'm going to magnetize this needle really quickly just using my knife. With just the one half of this needle, I'm busy polarizing using my knife. Put my needle on my grass. See, immediately it starts orientating itself, so that is definitely going to give us north. North on the lensatic compass and north on the field compass. That means that I'm sitting pretty much on the southwestern side of the big mountain behind me. And there's a high chance that if I go over this ridge here, I'll find water or at least really damp soil on the other side. Lo and behold, water. In 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, the Bible tells us that our warfare and our strife is not against the physical, not what we see around us, but against the spiritual. So when you're in the wilderness, bring your thoughts into submission before Christ and allow His peace to come over you. And when it comes to river crossings, you always want to start your crossing upstream of where you want to end. Always want to unhook your bag, especially your breast buckle um, from your bag. You can even only sling it over one shoulder. As I'm closing this, any extra air that's in here is going to help this bag to float so that your bag doesn't sink if you drop it. And it can help you with a bit of extra buoyancy. We want to avoid having to cross rivers in the first place and when we do have to cross a river we never want to cross where there are rapids and we never want to cross where the river or the speed of the water is faster than walking speed. Ideally you also don't want to have to cross the river where it's deeper than thigh depth. Make sure that you never approach rocks from the upriver side, always approach them from below, from downriver. For me to prevent hypothermia, what I need to do is separate the general macroclimate from the microclimate that immediately surrounds my body. So I need to create a barrier. I'm going to do that using a space blanket or a mylar blanket. From my fire kit, take a small tea candle. You can use anything that will burn. What I've effectively done is created a microclimate in here. I've got a pocket of air that I'm busy warming through this little candle. I've removed all of the cold, wet stuff from inside the shelter, so my wet clothes are outside, drying in the sun. At least I won't be losing heat through conduction because I'm wearing wet clothes. We have some seriously venomous snakes in the area, so plowing through this bush here, not, not my idea of fun. Okay, shoes off, doggy. bit deeper than I thought and I should actually ideally have undone my waist belt on my bag and just flung it over one shoulder but I underestimated how deep that water was um, so there's a lesson learned don't know whether I mentioned this before but having a plastic bag can be a great way to improvise a makeshift shelter um, should a storm suddenly come up which is the case here but this is the Western Cape the temperatures and the weather just changes all the time and I'm doggy and I are just sitting Indy? We're just sitting inside the plastic bag. Avoiding getting absolutely soaked. But it is still raining. Don't be discouraged if you have to make up some or the other shelter with whatever you've got on hand. But I'm still going to be able to get some pine nuts from this pine cone. As it happens, doggy can eat pine nuts. I can get a hold of some of the pine needles up there. Um, I can use that to create pine needle tea. All of the vitamin C and the vitamin A in those pine needles will seep out into my tea. Better to try and drink warm water or a tea rather than cold water. I see that there's a little bit of resin that's running out underneath one of these broken branches. And I can easily use that to start a fire. The other thing that makes pine a brilliant survival resource is fatwood. So fatwood is basically the resinous hardwood of a pine tree and it takes the spark really quickly from say a ferro rod and it also burns quite well. Um, there are some poisonous pines like the ponderosa pine, the yew, the Australian pine. So do your research and know the pines in your area well. White pine, red pine is usually perfectly fine to go for. 
So what I've got with me is my bow drill kit, my current kit. This is pine, um, it is dry. I harvested it from a standing um, dead pine. The principles behind a bow drill fire is that you're using a spindle to drill into your hearth board. What it does is it creates sawdust and a lot of heat. The sawdust consolidates into an ember and it's that ember that you then transfer into a tinder bundle or a little tinder nest that you've prepared beforehand. Now that my initial burn-in is done, or at least some of it, I can start to cut my notch. And I ideally just want an eighth of that to come out. The purpose of the notch is just to allow oxygen to get to the sawdust so that it can consolidate and form a coal or an ember. It takes a lot of energy to make a bow drill kit, to find the materials that you need for a bow drill kit and then to drill for fire. Notice how I've stopped drilling, but there's still smoke. Transfer it to my bird's nest. Just like that, I've got a bow drill fire. I'm gonna use my gloves to clean out this area, remove most of the branches and the twigs and the leaves, um, and then put something soft down to make a bed. The sun is back out, and I've got a couple hours to still build my shelter and get a fire started. So I've built myself a shelter here. It's just big enough for Indian eye to fit in underneath here. Um, and will stay warm because it is insulated with all of the grass and the leaves in the area. So I've cut some grass um, and some foliage from the area. This stuff is nice and soft, so I'm gonna lay this down on the ground to make it soft, a nice soft bed for myself. But I also want my bed to insulate me. So for that, I'm gonna use a space blanket or a mylar blanket. Now make no mistake, none of this is quick work. All of this takes time and a lot of energy. I reckon these stones are warm enough now. I'm going to start stacking some inside my shelter to start warming up the air inside the shelter. As I'm going to take them out, yeah, I can feel that's warm. I'm also going to replace them with new ones. Oh, that's hot. Well, I can actually feel that through the glove. So I'll take one off and replace it with another. I sawed halfway in on this side and I sawed halfway in on that side and now when I break it, I get two equal parts. Once the animal disturbs this, these two will be under pressure and once they break apart, that will action my trap. So I've basically taken two of my longest struts and tied them together with a length of paracord that's slightly longer than the two struts themselves are. I'm gonna cross it or twist them together so that it forms a cross or an X in the middle. I'm going to layer cross struts at intervals. So there's the first one. Okay, and then I'm gonna go in the opposite direction. This way, another one this way. Just wedge that in between there. Good, trap done. To disturb my little stick. All that's left for me is to set it up again, make it hairline and make sure that it's baited. The northern parts of plants or bushes or trees are going to get more sun than the southern parts. Point the 12 o'clock of my watch towards the sun in the northern hemisphere, you would point the hour hand of your watch towards the sun. And the shadow of my stick falls over the 12 o'clock and over the 6 o'clock. Now I know I'm pointing directly at the sun and I'm going to draw a line between the hour hand and the 12 o'clock on my watch. So that's gonna give me a line that points north. Now north is gonna be between my hour hand and the 12 o'clock. So I'm on the northern side of this bush over here. So I can set my transpiration bag up on this bush um, or on one of these branches and that's gonna give me the best chance of collecting water. I've got a bag that has a little string in it. We should be able to get some water from here within the next three or four hours. How much water that's gonna be is anybody's guess. Whether it's actually a viable amount of water, that's gonna depend on how many plastic bags you've got. 